Hi, and welcome back. This time we're going to be discussing CISSP Chapter 9 on Vulnerabilities. In our class, ITS 277, this will be Unit 1.2. In this chapter, we're going to finish out our first section of our Unit 1, Software Assurance on Risk Management and Vulnerability. We're going to follow this with Business Continuity Planning and Disaster Plan with Control Access and Testing and Assessment to finish out our Unit 1. Let's get started. So the first thing we're going to talk about is hardware vulnerabilities. And to understand hardware, the easiest way for me to always explain it is it's something tangible that you can touch. So your memory, your hard disk, um, your motherboard, your monitor, your keyboard, your mouse, something tangible. To contrast that with software or something that you can't reach out and touch, essentially a piece of code of some type. So when we look at hardware, the first thing we're going to be looking at is our processors, CPUs, and chips. Now there's a lot going on on this slide, so I'm going to try to break it down and make it as easy to understand as possible. You should have some understanding of what a processor or a chip is at this point, so I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time explaining the ins and outs. But there are a couple pieces of information that you need to understand. So the chip or the processor or the microprocessor is the CPU, the central processing unit for the computer. It's the thing that does all the work. Once you get to the concept of a chip, we can start discussing the differences between multitasking, multi-core, multi-programming, so on and so forth as we go along. Um, so starting with multitasking, a multitask process is multiple tasks or processes that occur at the same time within a single core on a chip. So within a single core, multitasking, portion of a chip, um, two or more tasks. In a single chip, you can have more than one core. We call that multi-core. So more than one core per chip. From that point of view, we can have the concept of multi-programming, which is multiple tasks on a single chip, but it's specifically designed for efficiency created by the OS. This is a batch processing issue. Multi-processing is where we have multiple chips, individual chips. So you have this chip here, this chip here, which can both have multiple cores, which can always do multiple tasking inside of it. So multi-processing, when you hear that, think of it as multiple chips, processing as chips. Multi-core is on a single chip, having multiple cores, break up independently, simultaneously on a single chip. And then multitasking is doing multiple processes, pieces of code running um, on a single core of a chip. And finally, we get to multi-threading. Multi-threading is where you have multiple tasks within a single process. So there's a little chart down here that hopefully will make this a little bit easier to understand. Multitasking to multi-core to multi-programming to multi-threading and how those are all interacting. When you think about how the chip needs to be protected from a security point of view, understanding how multitasking, multi-core, multi-programming, threading, and processing all interact together to run the individual tasks on the chip. When we talk about how pieces of information are protected, we talk about the rings of protection. So at the middle of our little bullseye here, we have ring zero. That's your kernel. That's your base memory. That's where the resident components hang out. And it's all done at the OS level of the, of the kernel. The way these rings work is we can say that processes can access higher or equal level rings of access, but not lower. So ring one references all of the other OS components. Ring two is individually your drivers or your protocols, with ring three being the main area where most of your user level programs and applications are going to run. Therefore, if you have a driver that is in ring two, it can deal with and talk to and access the user level programs in ring three, but it cannot go down into ring one or ring zero so that it can't access those. We do this for breaking pieces of information up into whether it's in user mode or in supervised or privileged mode when we get into the modes in the next slide. Understanding where certain things can be run and understood is really a good part of the rings of protection and understand the different rings and what aspect of the CPU is enabled at that ring. 
So at this point, we're going to describe process states and operating modes. A state machine essentially is this basic concept of there are multiple states that are available and you can move from one state to another, but at any point in time, the CPU is running in a given state. So we start with the ready state. You go into the ready state and it's ready. It's hanging out. It's doing its thing and it's waiting. At this point, if the CEPU is available and we ask it to do a task, it moves from the ready state to the running state. Now the task is being run. At this point, we have a couple of different options. If we are able to finish the entire process with no problems, we go straight from running back over to ready and we're fine. So going across the top. However, if we are blocked because we're waiting for IO input output or waiting for resources to become available, we move into the waiting stage while we wait and we hang out in the waiting stage until we are unblocked. Once we're unblocked, we go back to the ready stage. From there, we can move back to the running stage once we get to that point if the CPU is available. From the running stage, we also have the option of stopping. The process is done, it's over, it's been terminated, and we are done with this state machine going on here. A fifth state is kind of called the supervisory mode, which is going to go into our operating modes in just a second. Supervisory mode is a running mode or a running state, but it's running with higher privileges. You have more available instructions in a supervisory mode. This is kind of the concept of I needed to get extra permission to touch extra parts of the CPU, memory, whatever it is I'm doing, my kernel, my operating system as I go along. So you can have a supervisory mode that is kind of a privileged mode um, that allows that to be a state that you're in, which is very, very similar to a running state. So let's discuss the modes. When the CPU is working, it is in one of two modes. The user mode, which is where 90% of everything goes, that's where your user ex execution of your applications work. This is the normal concept of where everything is run from a GUI, from a user interface. If the user is running it as administrator, it's still being run in user mode. Everything there is in user mode if the user is doing something. Sometimes the process needs to move into privileged mode to be able to do something a little bit different, changing the kernel, changing the system. Privileged mode is where the operating system has the full range of instructions, not just basic user instructions. They can change the kernel, they can change the system, and getting into privileged mode is something that a lot of hackers would like to do because once they get there, they can make changes to your computer that can't be done from a basic user mode. Remember, user mode and privileged mode have nothing to do with your user access permissions. This is not where you say, hi, I'm John, I'm the administrator, I get to have special administrator privileges. Administrator privileges are still in user mode because the user is doing it through the basic user interface. Privileged mode is something that gets done in programming to allow you to access individual things that are usually outside of the user's control. So it's important for you to have a basic understanding of memory and how pieces of information are stored on a computer. Especially in cybersecurity, it's important to recognize the difference between ROM and RAM and secondary and primary memory. So first off, with ROM, ROM is read-only memory, R-O-M, read-only memory. And ROM is generally burned in the factory. Once it's been burned, it cannot be changed. It is also non-volatile. Volatile meaning when power is, is accessed, it does it lose its state when the power is removed. ROM is non-volatile, which means you can burn it in the factory, have no power to it, put it in a box, send it somewhere, put it into your computer, and then the data is still there. It's been burned in the factory. I always think of this as, you know, when you used to buy CDs or tapes and they were burned in the factory and you couldn't change them when you got home. From there, we have changed around basic ROM to use four different, well, really three different versions of ROM. The first is what we call programmable ROM or PROM, which allows the user to burn the contents, but only once. First time they get it, they're able to burn in the PROM. And now it's similar to what would have happened if it was burned in the factory. It's just done on the user's time. Then we come up with erasable programmable. What happened with EEPROM is that you could actually erase it and reburn it, but you had to go through a UV light thing where you actually had to take the chip out and use a UV light to be able to 
erase, and then allow it to be reburned. That was kind of a pain. So then we created EEPROM, or Electronically Erasable Programmable ROM. This uses voltage to erase. So it's, it's um, rather than using a UV light, we're actually using power to erase the original program and allow it to be reburned. This is the read-write version of a CD. Flash drives are similar to EEPROM, but they can erase in individual blocks and pages instead of as a whole. With basic EEPROM, you can only erase the whole thing and start over from scratch, but flash drives allow you to erase individual pieces and, and blocks and pages of the data rather than the whole thing, so it wasn't an all or nothing anymore. So those are our ROMs. RAM stands for Random Access Memory. And RAM is volatile. It only retains its data if the power is supplied, which means when you turn off the power or you lose your battery or you unplug it, all of the data that exists in the RAM goes away. So it is read and writable and it's used during processing individually. So it is not intended to be long-term memory. This is called your main memory or your primary memory or your real memory. And we generally refer to these as our dynamic RAM chips or our static RAM chips. In our RAM, we sometimes use cache RAM, either level one, two, three, or four cache memory, which is used to store individual data when it's going to be used multiple times. So if I'm going to continue to use this piece of data from my secondary storage, essentially from my, my hard drive or something like that, I can store this in my cache and allow it to be used quicker than having to go obtain it from my hard drive every time I need to access it. Static RAM uses flip-flops to maintain its contents and it does not have any CPU overhead. However, it is more expensive than basic dynamic RAM. Dynamic RAM uses capacitors. It's much cheaper, but it's also slower. Static RAM is faster. So if you don't mind the extra cost, buying static RAM is faster, um, whereas dynamic RAM is slower, but it costs less. Next, we refer to our secondary memory. So secondary memory is what most people think of when they ask, where did you store this on your hard drive? Where did you store this on your computer? Very rarely is it stored on your memory because your memory is volatile and as soon as you turn off the power, it'll go away. You usually store things on your hard drive or an optical drive or flash drive or something else that you can make sure is a non-volatile option. And we call that secondary memory. Anything that is not primary is therefore secondary. So we generally think of RAM as your primary and then secondary memory is your hard drive, your SSD, um, your optical and your flash drives. In addition to that, we also have virtual memory, which is where we take the real memory, primary memory, main memory, our RAM, and we expand it to use up some of the space that exists in our hard drive so that we can get a little bit of the benefits of having something in RAM without having um, to increase the size of our RAM. You'll find when you're using applications that use a lot of RAM, your computer may slow down because it's using up all of that space in your primary memory. Having a virtual memory can kind of expand that without having to purchase more RAM um, uh, chips. When we talk about memory, we always refer to things called registers, and they're different locations in your memory that we address. There are multiple types of addressing. So this is hopefully something you've already learned before, so this should be review. Basic register addressing just addresses the register directly. I'm going to register two. Immediate addressing refers to the data as part of the instruction. So you can have some literals in there. If I'm gonna add two plus X, the value two is a literal. So some of the data may be included in the instruction and we call that immediate addressing. You don't have to go find it somewhere. The data isn't somewhere else. It's included in the instruction that was given to um, the CPU to process. Direct addressing gives the actual address of the memory location, but it must be in the same memory page as the instruction. So it has to be in the same area um, to be able to use direct addressing. Indirect addressing, as opposed to direct addressing, actually gets a reference or a pointer to the memory location. So we are going to say, go get the data that's going to be in memory one, two, three, whatever it happens to be. We're going to be giving you a reference 
to the address location, which you can go and then get. It takes a little bit more time, but it also means that it doesn't have to be in the same memory page. And the last one is our base and offset. So what happens in this case is we give you a base memory address and account of how far that data is from the base address. If you're going to be referencing data that comes in the same memory section um, or segment, you can give a base with multiple offsets and it's easier for the CPU to go find that data from that memory register. When we talk about storing our data, we have to put it somewhere. So again, we have primary versus secondary. And primary, every time you hear it, you should think of your RAM. It's volatile. It goes away when you turn off the power. And everything else that is not RAM is secondary memory. Your hard drives, your SDDs, um, or SSDs, your flash drives, your tapes, your CDs, your DVDs, your flashcards. These is everything else. And they're all considered secondary storage because they're stored for a long term as opposed to a short term. RAM is short term. The other piece of information we look at is power, volatile versus non-volatile. Volatile doesn't store it when power goes out, such as RAM. Non-volatile stores it even without power, like a CD or a hard drive. And then we look at how it's accessed. Is it random or sequential? So random access reads and writes from any point using addressing, whereas sequential reads them from the top to the bottom. If you're old enough to remember VHS tapes or cassettes where you started from a specific start point and you have to fast forward to get to the next section. You are reading it in sequential order. It has to start from the beginning and you have to use fast forward to get forward. Um, you can't just pick, I want to go listen to this song. It was a great thing when we were kids because if you wanted the fourth song on a cassette, you had to fast forward plus the other three songs, which was kind of annoying. If you want to protect your data on your devices, as a company, as a cybersecurity person, you need to be aware of what is the data that's on that device. If you have any long-term storage, make sure it gets purged before it is ever thrown away or given away or even just thrown in the garbage. All long-term storage should be purged. Data can often remain in the device even after it is quote unquote deleted. Deleting usually just removes a location or a pointer to that data, but the data still exists. Or maybe it just says, you know, we can't find it anymore, but it doesn't replace it with zeros or ones or some random number. So what we can do is we can sanitize it. Sanitizing your disk can usually mean either damaging it, destroying it, running through a shredder. You can do a full disk encryption, which makes it a little bit difficult, and you can purge it and use different ways to be able to clear the entire drive. It, Brace everything and replace it all with zeros. Um, so when you want to get rid of a piece of data on a drive of some type, make sure that it is always purged. People don't really think about all of the private information that they store on hard drives, pictures and, and personal information that can be used for identity theft. This is where you go back to that dumpster diving lecture. We also have the concern of emanation security. So this was originally created out of Tempest that was designed to protect us from EMPs, nuclear war, some sort of nuclear explosion that was going to um, destroy all computers. So how do we do that? We protect from emanation. The ways to do this, you can use a Faraday cage. So protect it with a Faraday cage so that no um, emanations can come into the device. You can also use things like white noise um, to be able to protect from microphones picking up sound or different things like that. Sometimes the white noise can be in high enough frequencies that it will damage anybody trying to listen in without making it so that you can hear it. High enough frequency, your ears can't hear it, the dogs might. Um, you can also use control zones to be able to protect from specific locations and say in this location you're fine, you're protected, and there's no way that emanations can come in. Remember, a lot of the devices that we use these days use Bluetooth or wireless, and we do a lot with um, different things coming across the internet from wireless devices. All of those are going through waves, and we need to protect ourselves from those. Um, sometimes if you have your cell phone with you, remember it's passing out a GPS location every time you move, sending it to the tower. If you want to protect that, you can put your phone in a Faraday cage or a Faraday bag, they sell them, which will protect your phone and make it so that that ping asking for your GPS location isn't found anymore. A lot of people don't think of IO devices as a security flaw, but it can be. 
monitors, the biggest concept is shoulder surfing or using a telephoto lens to see your, your monitor. Pretty basic concepts, make sure that your camera um, or that your monitor is, is turned away from where anybody can see it. Make sure nobody's shoulder surfing. With printers, if you're going to print on a common printer, is there some data that's going to be either stored in a multifunction printer or did you just forget to pick up the document? This actually happens in a lot of companies. We're going to print out secret, top secret information on the company printer that is going to be shared and somebody else gets to it before we do. Some multifunction printers allow you to send a fax or send an email of documents that are scanned in. A quick little virus that says, oh, and every time somebody prints from this printer, go ahead and shoot me over an email with that same print is a way that you could attack a printer and allow that information to go to a hacker. Keyboards and mice allow you to do things like bugging or keystroke spying. So essentially they can't see your monitor, but they can feel every time you touch your keyboard. Remember, when a keyboard gets hit, especially a wireless keyboard, it isn't actually um, directly making those changes. It's reacting to that, sending a signal to the computer and saying, this is what my key was. So when you type in your password on a wireless keyboard, somebody else who is listening on that same frequency could hear the same things that your keyboard is doing. So be aware when you're typing on a wireless keyboard that there is different ways that that signal for Bluetooth could be intercepted. Modems allow, and they're pretty old and antiquated these days, but they do allow a possibility of adding an access point. There's a, um, a comment about a hack where you can go into a company and if you can find one of the little IO, you know, Cat5 connectors, this may be behind a couch or underneath a table or something like that, take your, your access point, plug it into the, the Cat5 and be able to get network access sent out over your personal Wi-Fi, whatever it is you choose to do. So be aware of uncontrolled access points from modems. Your firmware, again, your EEPROM or your ROM, um, your, your read-only memory, is where your BIOS and your UEFI are going to exist. Now, this isn't a class on the internals of your firmware, so I'm not going to get into your BIOS and your UEFI, with the exception of just reminding you that the concept of flashing is being able to update those. And... Um, being able to create a secure boot is to protect your UEFI from prevent from um, changing unsigned or preventing unsigned drivers. So making sure that your drivers are signed before you use any of them. A measured boot is an optional feature that allows you to store the hash elements of items in the boot in your TPM, your trusted platform module, so that you can make sure that the hash or the checksum or the MD5 is going to be the same regardless. So that if somebody goes in and changes your BIOS, someone changes in your boot, that you would know that that, that hash is now different, that there is something that has happened. And since it's stored in your TPM, you can make sure that every time you load up your computer, is it the right boot that's being loaded? The link here is to some TrickBot malware that allows you to um, do some damage using IO devices. So that covers most of our concepts of hardware. So now we're going to start talking about some software. So with client-based systems, these are systems where the program is being run on a client machine, usually a web browser on the client, but it could also be a program of itself couple of different things. First, we have applets, which is code that is sent from the server to the client, but it is a self-contained program. The reason we do this is so that the processing burden is on the client, not the server. So if I have a million clients that are all running, the server doesn't have to do all of the processing. Those can be done at the client level. So it distributes that processing expanse upon all of the different devices rather than having them all run by the server. It's a great idea. However, security concerns with the applets, because the remote code is executed on the client machine, the user is never 100% sure that that data is safe. Is that remote code what it was supposed to be? Being able to have an applet that is not what you intended it to do will allow that to run on the client's machine, therefore open it up to risk. Changing temporary files, cookies, things like cross-site scripting can occur when you use applets. Fun thing about applets, so Java applets, which is owned by Java and therefore Oracle, and ActiveX controls from Microsoft are both essentially end of life. 
they're pretty much gone. We don't really use applets anymore. Um, ActiveX controls are still kind of available if you're using Internet Explorer, but essentially nobody uses them anymore because there were such significant security flaws with it. However, JavaScript is still widely used. So JavaScript allows that cross-site scripting and that cross-site um, exploits to be able to um, request forgery, to be able to um, take over your client machine and do things with it, open up additional sessions, download files, make changes to your computer. So while we don't really have to worry as much about Java applets and ActiveX controls anymore, we do need to be very aware of how JavaScript is run on our client-based systems. Server-based systems are designed for full-stack systems where we have a front-end, a back-end, and then a database. So the back end is usually written in either a .NET language or Java or PHP, and it's run on your server. So data flow control refers to the movement of data between processes and devices and networks, and we move data from point A to point B. We can use load balancing to speed up or distribute our network traffic across multiple devices. This can, of course, lead to DDoS attacks. Um, with our large-scale parallel data systems, we divide up multiple tasks and distribute them. We can have either symmetric multiprocessing or asymmetric multiprocessing. Symmetric multiprocessing, SMP, is where the multiprocessing contains a common data bus and memory and everybody gets an equal distribution and they all have a centralized OS. Asymmetric multiprocessing is where each individual processor is independent of the other one. Everybody has their own bus, everyone has their own memory, everybody does their own thing without talking to the other people people, processes. Um, grid computing is the concept of parallel processing, but it's divided into groups with still a central management of the primary core servers. So the primary core servers are still going to have to central management, but everybody's kind of grow, divided up into groups, and then we can do parallel processing with those groups. This is in contrast to peer-to-peer, -peer, where all of the peers share, but there is no singular central management. There is no single computer or set of computers that is going to be making those decisions amongst all the peers. Everybody just kind of makes their own decisions as they go along. A lot of times when we talk about security, we talk about businesses and full stack development, websites and client and server controls. It's important to also understand industrial control systems and other types of controls that are not just basic software. A lot of times we look at basic software and think, well, the programmer needs to go ahead and do security inside there. But in industrial control systems, things are done a little bit differently. So ICS or industrial control systems are also referred to as operational technology, and they refer to the control of industrial processes. We can have distributed control systems that are state driven. We can have programmable logic controllers, which are single purpose, or we could have SCADA, which is supervisory control and data acquisition. So data gathering and they're event driven. When something occurs, do an event of some type. We find these type of controls on manufacturing floors, production lines, controlling things like batteries and weaponry and different things throughout the universe, throughout the world. The thing about ICS systems is that they have very little human interface, which means we don't generally put a whole lot of security in. It's a PLC, it's programmable logic controller that all it is going to do is one thing, control the temperature of this device. The problem with not having a lot of security is that there's a lot of easy ways to get into it if you can get there. So in this case, um, there are some security guidelines that you want to reference, such as the NIST SP882 and um, the IEC 62443 or the ISA 99. All three of these standards and guidelines are going to be necessary if you intend to be working in any industry where these PLCs or SCADA devices exist. If something is being manufactured, something is going to be physically built, you have some sort of a manufacturing floor or production line, you probably have some sort of industrial control system running the whole thing. Having an understanding of what are the security guidelines and standards in that industry is important. If you think that the security in these devices is not necessary, make sure that you go read up on Stuxnet. You probably have heard about it at some point prior in your education, but that was a cicada device that was attacked in a nuclear arms issue. So 
we want to make sure that our industrial control systems are protected and taken care of. Distributed systems or distributing computing environments, DCEs, are collections of systems that work together. By having multiple computers working together and giving an entire environment, we can create resiliency or reliability, increase our performance, and allow it to scale. The example that we use for this one is blockchain, which most of you recognize as the underlying components of Bitcoin. You create a ledger of records, transactions, operations, whatever, and it's verified using hashing and timestamps. Every time you get an additional record, the entire chain is rehashed. You can even have it distributed with a public ledger that's hosted in multiple systems to ensure that nobody can have the ability to disrupt one section of the ledger without the other one saying, hey, that isn't the right hash, that's wrong. Um, so it's much better for reliability and integrity of your, of your ledger by using this type of distributed computing. Generally, a DCE program is going to have an interface definition language or an IDL that design, defines how the um, computing environment is going to communicate between clients and servers. It isn't language specific. It's going to be independent of if you're going to use Java or C Sharp or F Sharp or um, Python or whatever it is you're going to use for your language. That's independent. The IDE is going to simply say, how are these computers going to talk to each other? The risks of blockchains and distributed computing is obviously people coming in that are unauthorized, people coming in impersonating, so same thing as unauthorized except they're using an authorized user, um, bypassing security altogether, eavesdropping. Sometimes there's not as much monitoring or auditing. You think that because everything is so public that it doesn't need it and lack of accountability. Again, because everything is so public, do we really need an audit trail? Uh, yeah, you always need an audit trail. You always need to audit. You always need that accountability to make sure that somebody is held accountable if there are any issues in your distributed system. When we discuss a high performance computer or high performance computing, those are designed to perform complex calculations at very high speeds. There are specific computers out there that are determined to be a HPC or a high performance computing. Sometimes computers just need to run a little bit faster. So mobile devices or IoT devices, sometimes you're streaming media, voice assistants. If you think about how fast it happens that you say into your phone, Siri, what time is it? And she has the ability to go out, find the answer and give it back to you instantly. That's really fast computing. So um, it's also used in 3D modeling and AI or machine language calculations. If you are interested in high performance computing, the top500.org keeps a list of all of the highest performance devices out there. How many cores, how many flops, so on and so forth. The three main elements of a high performance computing is how much compute resources does it have, what is its network capability, and what is its storage capacity. When we think about a device running and doing certain calculations, a high performance computer can actually suffer from a benign DOS attack, which is essentially there's not enough resources to do what we want the service to be doing. It isn't a legitimate attack in the sense that some nefarious actor is doing that threat. It is simply that you ran out of resources. You didn't have enough resources to store it all. You didn't have enough memory. You didn't have enough cores. You didn't have enough computing resources to continue with whatever services that you're asking it to do. A real-time operating system, or an RTOS, is designed to handle the data as it arrives with minimal latencies. Generally, RTOSs are designed for a single purpose, and they're exceedingly focused. What happens a lot of times is when something is single purpose, it has a little bit of, it has very little security. It doesn't have a lot of security running because they're thinking it's only being used for one single purpose. But sometimes we need to be aware, those are the cases where sometimes things can get in and cause some risk. So always be aware of what's going on in those situations if you do use an RTOS. When we think of security with the Internet of Things, so smart devices like phones or tablets, music players, your sports camera, your VR, your fitness tracker. 
An, e an IoT is simply a smart device that is attached to the internet. Now I can have a VR system or a fitness tracker that for whatever reason is not connected to the internet. Once we connect it to the internet, it is now part of the internet of things. So that's kind of the differentiation between a smart device and an IoT device. An IoT device is a smart device that is connected to the internet. Security issues with IoT devices usually involve access and encryption. And again, because these are generally single-use devices, they are designed for one single purpose, security is added as an afterthought. We need to make sure that when building a music player or a sports camera or a fitness tracker, that we take into account security from the beginning. Always from the beginning, never add it in as an afterthought. When we think of IoT or automation in business, we can include things like environmental controls, automation of doors, asset tracking, and consumable inventory management. In a lot of companies these days, there is management of consumables where it keeps track of how much coffee do we need, how much toilet paper do we need, you know, papers and office supplies. And sometimes that consumable inventory management with automatic reordering is done through an automation process. How can you solve that or how can you um, attack this? Well, I could change how much is being delivered each time. I can skim off the top and put some things away for myself, sell those individually. This is how different hackers could get into a consumable inventory management system. The Internet of Things has an addition of an industrial Internet of Things, which is just an IoT, but designed to focus on the industrial engineering manufacturing world. Always a good idea to keep an eye on the NIST initiatives in IoT from the link that's above. Edge computing is as opposed to cloud or remote locations where we have our data or our resources that are in separate locations and it's a very far distance between the two. So when we think of edge computing, we're thinking about the execution being as close to the network's edge as possible, as close to the user. The examples of these are like many web servers, security systems, cameras. When you have security cameras, they may be storing the data locally on the local machine and only storing it in the cloud um, off hours. Self-driving cars don't need to have an internet connection all the time, so they store things locally, you're doing edge computing, and then when necessary, pushing up to the cloud to push data up. In fog computing, it's relying on the sensors and the IoT devices of edge computing to get the data and then send it to a central location for processing. So the edge computer collects all of your data and it's holding it. And then when it can, it's going to process it and push it up to the cloud computing for the central computers to process it. So the edge computer collects it, the central computers process the data. And we call that fog computing. An embedded system is any computing component added to an existing mechanical or electrical system, something that is embedded in a system, usually for the purposes of automation or perhaps remote control or monitoring. If you already have a sprinkler system, but you add a Raspberry Pi to control the sprinklers, that would be an embedded system. If you have a basic coffee maker and you add a Wi-Fi component to it or the ring doorbell system where you can have a regular doorbell and you add, an ex add a component to an existing electrical system for the purposes of remote control automation and monitoring. So those are all embedded systems. Generally, embedded systems are built with something similar to a system on a chip or an SOC. Kind of a small computer, generally includes a CPU, some memory, some I.O. options, a little bit of RAM, and some non-volatile memory, just like a regular computer. For example, the Raspberry Pi, the Arduino, the FPGA listed over here on the side. They're small computers that are not intended to be full-blown, take it as a laptop and go home with it, but are intended to add a single computing component to an existing system. Generally, our embedded systems are gonna be static. The problem with them being static is that there's no ability to address the vulnerabilities after the fact. Once we have it, installing updates and patches is not as easy as it is with a normal computer. The purpose of an embedded system is generally to minimize cost, to add some extraneous features, but they end up with this problem where there is a huge lack of security and difficulty once they find a loophole or a hole somewhere in there that a, that a hacker can take advantage of, it's difficult to upgrade them or to add patches because they're just not designed for that purpose. A lot of embedded systems don't have the ability to connect to a network. 
how are you going to install a patch on a ROM that's already been burned and there's no patch and there's no way to connect to the internet. Um, so a lot of times with embedded systems, it's safer just to toss it away and go get a new one um, with the new upgraded features. Microservices or microcomputers are generally a feature of a service-oriented architecture, or SOA. So if you see SOA, not Sons of Anarchy, service-oriented architecture, it means that new applications are built out of existing but separate distinct software services. So microservices, for example, are web-based solutions that are SOAs. They usually have a single element feature function or whatever of the web application that's called upon by other web applications. Sometimes these are APIs with clearly defined and secure IO so that I can say in the middle of my application, I want to go out to the Bing Maps website and find a map of this location. Um, I'm going to use a microservice from Bing Maps to add into my web-based solution. So it's somebody else's entire program that I'm going to pull across. Now, I don't need all of Bing. I don't need all of their map system. I just need the ability to make this individual map with a piece of information I give it, maybe an address or two addresses, finding the driving directions from one to the other, um, and being able to pull those in to my web app, a microservice. It's a small little service that I'm stealing, borrowing, taking, purchasing from another um, application. API, again, application programming interface, is usually how these are done. Um, there are some APIs with programs like QuickBooks. So if you have an accounting program that is a custom piece of software, you can use some of QuickBooks API options to be able to pull in some information from their online sources and bring it into your personal um, program. You always need to be aware of the idea that a microservice may not have the same security features that you require. So you always need to go through some version of testing, either black box testing or fuzz testing, to ensure that the piece of API is secure that's coming into your system. A service delivery platform is a collection of components that provide the architecture for service delivery. Usually this is related to telecommunications, so voice over IP, or some sort of communication over the phone lines or um, internet lines for uh, via VoIP, um, voice over IP, or um, different types of situations like that. But the service delivery platform, the SDP, is all of the components that provide that architecture for your service delivery. Most of the time when we're thinking of infrastructure, we're thinking of a server, some RAM, some disks, um, maybe some CPUs, a couple of cores, in a box somewhere, here's my infrastructure. However, the concept of infrastructure as code has started to come into play. This concept of being able to configure your hardware as a collection of elements and manage it the same way that we manage software using version control, using pre-deployment testing, testing code, doing reasonable checks, regression testing, source control, all of these options. It makes it really easy to streamline your infrastructure changes. So if I say we need to put up a new server or I need to upgrade my server, I have some sort of version control to say the server here is this CPU with this memory and this disk space and this connections and these drivers and here is my infrastructure. Um, I need to upgrade that. So let me look at what I have and find out what needs to be upgraded and then create a new version with the new upgraded parts. We can also do this with VMs. So with virtual machines, you can go in there and you can say, this is the exact description of the server that I need to build. And by having it all defined and documented with a series of checks, it really helps to make sure that when you need to change infrastructure, it's as streamlined as possible. We can do the same thing with a storage area network or even a software divine network, being able to use software and code the same components that we would use when writing code, such as version control, and source control, testing, are things that we do when we're writing code. But if you do it while you're building your infrastructure, you can be as assured that everything's going to work right. The concept of immutable. So immutable, which comes from the base word of mute or mutate, which means to change. 
I always have a vision of Jeff Goldblum in the fly every time I say the word immutable because I'm envisioning the mutating concept. Immutable means it can't be changed. So if you hear the word mutate in there, immutable means not mutating or cannot be changed after deployment. In immutable architecture, we actually lock down everything in the architecture so that nothing can be changed after it's been deployed. This prevents a hacker from going in there and swapping out a hard drive or changing around your memory or something along those lines. Nothing can be changed in the architecture because it is immutable. If you want to change something, you want to increase the memory, you want to change out the hard drive, you want to change the CPU, you literally create a new server, clone the server, make the changes that you want, and then deploy the new server and pull down the old server. So you actually get rid of the old server and put the new server in its place rather than making a change to an individual server. Again, this adds a level of security. Nothing can be changed, so we don't have to worry about hackers changing anything. Hypervisor is a part of a virtual machine manager or virtual machine monitor to allow us to build our VMs and to help things stay organized. When you're thinking about a hypervisor, there are two different ways that we can do that. A type one hypervisor is a bare metal hypervisor. There is no OS. The OS has to be created as part of the virtual machine. Whereas a type two hypervisor is hosted with a standard OS, which allows the guest OSs to exist within the hypervisor type two control. So you have your hardware. If you have hypervisor as the next level from your hardware, you're talking about a type one bare metal native hypervisor with no OS. Type two has a standard OS allowing everything to be hosted in the hypervisor inside of that OS. Cloud computing has become really popular lately, mostly because it's such a great, ex less expensive version of having things hosted on site. If I need to just spin up another VM, I click a button and it charges me for time used. I know that if I need to spin down because I bought too much, I can spin down my VM and I can make it um, so it stays within my budget. However, there are some privacy concerns and some regulatory compliance issues. Sometimes for data needs to be hosted within your host country. The United States does that sometimes where if you want to store your data, it must be hosted within the contiguous 48 states or within your own state um, just to prevent issues with other countries getting involved with your data. With cloud computing, you can usually tell the cloud provider, keep this within the contiguous 48 states, keep this in this country, keep this in this region. Um, but there's still some concerns and you have to think about those when deploying to a cloud computing. Cloud computing, you can't be assured who else is on your server network where your um, VM is being hosted. And as hackers get more and more competent at being able to either transverse out of directories, going into different VMs, you always risk some data getting exposed where it shouldn't be. So you always want to be aware of the risks of cloud computing. That doesn't mean it happens often. And usually there is some SLA that will guarantee that your data won't be exposed. However, you want to be aware of those privacy concerns when using cloud computing. The virtualization allows you to launch several instances of a virtual service as needed. So if you end up with a situation where I need to spin up five more VMs tomorrow, right now, 15 minutes, you can do that pretty easily in a cloud computing situation or by using virtualization. You can say, I want five of this exact example of this VM, and it can do that. Just click the button, create it. It's a nice way to handle end of life, end of service life, and end of service when you use virtualization. Because if you do run into an end of service, it's pretty easy to pull down the VM, put a new one up, or more importantly, put a new one up, transfer any information you need, and then pull the old one down. A virtual application is a piece of software that is running on a VM, so an application that is run virtually. The concept of containerization has really started to take off. Originally, when you do a VM of some example, and there's a little chart here just to help you to visualize it, you run your system. So assuming you're doing a type one hypervisor, you have your system, you have your host OS. So you're running it on a Linux box, you're running it on a Windows server, it doesn't matter, your host OS, put the hypervisor on top of it. 
And then inside the hypervisor, every individual VM has to replicate the entire guest OS. So if I want to run a MacBook or a, a iOS, if I want to run a Linux on top of my Windows Server, if I want to run a Windows Server on top of my Linux, I install the entire guest OS, including all the libraries as necessary, and then the application itself. However, if all three of my applications are all running on the same OS, all three of them are running on a Linux box on top of my Windows server, or vice versa, it's a Windows server and I have three Windows boxes that are running, Windows servers that are running as VMs. Containerization allows you to have a host OS and then the applications use that host OS directly. So rather than having each individual guest OS duplicated in each VM, all of my applications run safely within their own container on top of my host OS. Most of the time, it really doesn't matter to you which OS you have. All that matters is, does the app work? And if the app works on the host OS that you have, you can reduce your overhead by putting it in, into containers. So containers have allowed us to eliminate the duplication of that OS. By the way, if you ever see AAS, or for example, XAAS, as in anything, it simply means as a service. When you run something as a service, you usually charge the user for service time, uptime, how much time is actually being used, how much compute time, how much memory, whatever it is that's being used. And we, we charge it out at per hour, per gigabyte, per gigabyte per second, whatever it happens to be that you're providing as a service. As a services have become kind of the, the, the nice way of handling not having a hardware closet in your building, or maybe you don't even have a building, everything is remote, but we can keep all of the things that we need to run as a service up in the cloud, some version is that. Technically, any mobile device is something with a battery. Generally, when we talk about mobile devices, we intend phones or tablets or laptops. When we think of a mobile device, it is a device, usually a computing device, that is used for doing computation on the go um, with a battery. So you aren't plugged into a wall. That doesn't mean that your laptop isn't plugged into the wall because your battery isn't working anymore. Still a mobile device, anything with battery. For phones, we tend to break it into either iOS or Android, so the Linux Google version or the Apple version. And there are multiple features that are on all mobile devices um, or most mobile devices, and it kind of goes along with each version of what you have. There are some programs that allow mobile device management, which allows your company to actually manage the mobile device. What apps are installed, they can reflash it as necessary, they can um, read texts and, and deal with emails that go across there, make sure that it stays safe and secure and deal with your updates. We can ensure authentication, encryption, essentially the ability to use a fingerprint to log in, a way to make sure that only you can access your data, the ability to remotely wipe it. So if it is lost, any data that's on that device can be wiped. We can lock out the device, again, if it's stolen. Um, screen lock, stop somebody from being able to get into your device without putting in a passcode. Knowing where the device is, which can go back to your mobile device management, some of the mobile device management programs like Meraki will allow you to say, where is this device? And it knows where its GPS location is and it can send it back to the um, CNC, the Control and Command Center. Um, they can again control your content, make sure you control the applications. They can do push notifications to make sure that things get updated into your computer um, or your mobile device or your laptop. Obviously, three, port three third party apps, being able to break up storage segmentation so that data is only stored either on a flash drive or um, on an SIM card or on your SD card, wherever you choose to store things. Mobile devices can be used for asset tracking and inventory. They can, of course, have removable storage, um, rooting and jailbreaking, side loading, and then carrier unlocking. One of the nice things with carrier unlocking is that if you want a specific type of mobile device, but you don't want the, the company, the carrier that goes with it, you can buy an unlocked device and use it with any carrier you want. I want this device and I want to use it with AT&T. I want to use it with Verizon. I want to use it with T-Mobile, whichever one I happen to use. I can take this and it is not carrier specific. This allows you to switch carriers as you feel fit. When we talk about a company needing a mobile device, 
This becomes a conversation in a lot of companies, especially when you start getting into MFA, so multi-factor authentication. If you are going to require that you use multi-factor authentication, sometimes that means you need to have a phone or a smartphone to be able to get a text message so that you can get that code so you can put it back in every single time that you want to log into your system. Some companies will provide you with a phone specifically for this purpose, and some com companies will allow you to use your own phone. There is always the risk when you, you are using a device that is not owned and managed by the company that there's going to be personal information on the device and that perhaps it can be used by personal reasons rather than for business purposes. So we generally refer to four different deployment policies. The first most people understand, the bring your own device. You bring your device, you buy it, you own it, you manage it, you use it, and you use it both for company time and personal time. So if you need to use it for MFA, you can use your own personal device. This is pretty common. Um, put in your personal phone number and that's the phone number that your MFA code goes to, um, however you choose to use your mobile device. You can have corporate owned, personally enabled, or what we call COPE. The company buys the device, but you get to use it as you see fit. You can use it for personal or work activities, but it belongs to the company. At the end of the day, the company owns it, they pay the bill on it, and at any point you are required to give it up when you leave the company. So this is a situation where, you know, you would be given a new phone on onboarding, you will be taken away on offboarding, and in the meantime, you're welcome to use the phone for your personal device um, to communicate with your spouse and your friends and whatever. Um, it's still your phone. You just have to give it up when the company, when you leave the company. Some companies have a choose your own device where the company has decided these are the devices that we will support. You buy it and you can use it for both personal and work activities and you own it, but you are limited on which devices you can use. If the company is an Apple shop and everything they do is used through Apple, you may be given the choice of three iPhones. And those are the only phones that you can use because their apps are designed to work with iPhones. Therefore, it's important that you have to use those, those devices. Same direction if you wanted to go with an Android, it's an Android shop. Therefore, you can have to use an Android device because it needs to be able to go through the Android store to be able to get the applications that you need to use for your phone. At the end of the day, it's your phone and you can use it for whatever purposes you want, but you have to use one of those while you are working at the company. And the safest and best option for most corporates is corporate owned mobile strategy or business only, COBO or COMS company buys device and the device is only used for business purposes. The company owns it and you will have to get a second device for your personal use. Do not use the company device to call your spouse, to call your friends, to meet up for drinks after work. That has nothing to do with this, per this company device. The company device is used only for company business. Again, safest way from a company's point of view, you get your company email on your company device, but you don't get your personal email on the company device, which means that the company information stored on that device is not put at risk by your personal activities. Each company will determine the, the benefits and drawbacks of each of these development policies and make sure that it is very well understood by the employees at the company. When we talk about the policy details, and there's a lot of information in this section of the book, so I recommend you take a few minutes to at least flip through it and explain, make sure you understand what all of these terms mean. When we talk about the policy details, we wanna find out who owns the data and who is responsible for the support, update and patch management. Essentially, when you get the updates, how soon from the time you get the update do you have to do it? Is it your responsibility as the owner of the phone or is it the company's responsibility to handle updates? Patch update management and security product management, essentially making sure that any antiviruses on that soft on the phone are up to date and taken care of. When it comes to forensics, there's a legal aspect that comes with privacy of your device, your phone, forensically, are they allowed to take your phone at any point and search the interior of your phone forensically, looking at swap spaces and different data fields? Um, is that an invasion of privacy? Make sure you understand these items when it comes to writing out your policy. How is privacy done? If you're using the phone for personal business, 
Are you allowed to be sending texts back and forth to your spouse? Are those texts protected under privacy? Or is there an understanding that any text that is sent from this phone is company ownership? They are owned, the data is owned by the company. So any text that you have, the company can know about. How are you going to handle onboarding and offboarding? Do they get a new device on onboarding? Do they lose it when they go to offboarding? How do they handle that? Um, do you get the device after a certain amount of time? Do they use their own device? How do you make sure to get company data off their personal device when they are offboarded? If it's a bring your own device, it's their phone. How are you going to handle ensuring that no company data is on that phone when they are terminated from your employment? How is that phone adhere to company policies? What is the user acceptance? Make sure that the employees all understand it and sign off on it. Again, are you making decisions on the architecture, the infrastructure, legal concerns, and make sure you have an acceptable use policy. Again, if you are getting a phone for business purposes and it is used through that company, can you use it to send text to your friends, send text to your spouse? Are these okay? Can you take pictures while you're on vacation with your company phone? Is that an acceptable use? Make sure all of that is documented in your acceptable use policy. What is the use of the camera and or the video and the microphone? How are those handled? Is there a Wi-Fi direct issue? Essentially, can you use it as a hotspot or tethering? Can you use it for contactless payment? If you want to use Samsung Pay or Apple Pay and use the little swipe thing with your phone, is that acceptable with your business phone? And at the end of it all, what happens if you want to clone your SIM? So you have your SIM, you want to get a new phone, you want to pull the SIM, put it in a new one. If the SIM is cloned, how is that going to be handled as far as your mobile device policy? Each of these items, and I realize there's 18 of them on this page, each of these items are an important thing to think about when building your mobile device policy. Different ways that you can protect your company with a device of some type, mobile device, embedded device, um, industrial device. Isolate your processes. The OS providing separate memory space for each process, such as containerization, to make sure that there is no unauthorized data access and the integrity of the data is limited to just the section of the OS that is signs for that process. For hardware segmentation, make sure that different processes or security levels are enforced through hardware controls as opposed to logic from the OS. So hardware segmentation is where the hardware is going to enforce those controls. It isn't just guaranteeing that the OS is setting you up as a super user or a regular user or a guest user. That's all done through logic. But if the hardware control is doing it, the hardware is now segmented. And finally, you have your system security policy. Make sure that your employees understand, give them the guide and the development to be able to build their system using the proper testing and maintenance, and make sure that there's understanding of the rules and practices and procedures. This should all be re revisited every time a new project starts. Make sure that system security is always forefront in any project or anything that is done in the company's name. A couple of ways to describe the flaws in architecture. So we refer to covert channels. Passing information over a path that's not usually used for communication. So the opposite of covert is overt. Essentially, the overt channel to get into my house is going through the front door. It's known, it's expected, it's authorized, it's designed, it's monitored, and it's controlled. You have to knock on my door, I have to open it, I have to let you in. It's got, you know, a security camera, it's got a lock, it's that's the way you're supposed to get into my house. The overt channels are the way you get into a system normally. That's how most systems are designed with authorization and everything, making a big steel door with 17 locks and a way to make sure nobody can get through that door. Covert channels are going any other way except the overt channel. So getting into the house over a way that's not usually used. Two different covert channels that we describe are covert timing which is where you actually modify a resource's timing by changing the performance of a component. This is a little weird to visualize because you just can't imagine anybody going through this much effort, but you actually can use timing to convey bits. For example, blinking lights or the speed of a fan or the internet util utilization. If I want to send a series of bits, which is data, everything comes down to bits, I can make a blinking light be two blinks is on and one blink is off. 
So two blinks is a one and one blink is an off. And I can make the blinking lights do this. And therefore I can be sending data. Obviously, that's not the way data is normally uh, brought across. It's not a normal channel, but it is a way of getting data from a system using covert channels. So we call that timing channel, covert timing, modifying the timing. So the speed of a fan, if it goes faster, that means it's a one. If it goes slower, that means it's a zero. Um, internet utilization, if it's normally, I don't know, 50, make it 100 when you want to mean a one and make it 50 when it's a zero. And the internet utilization can speed up and slow down and it can actually pass data, zeros and ones, across covert channels. The other is what we call a storage channel. So that's timing. Storage channels is essentially writing to common storage areas so that something else can read it. Storage areas such as unallocated spaces, bad blocks and sectors, slack space, sectors and clusters that are not res that don't have proper registration. When you store a piece of data on your computer, there is a table in the computer that says, this file exists in this memory location. This is how you can find it. That's how they know what data is in your system. If there is no, that this data is at this memory location, but there's something at that memory location, that could be writing to a section or cluster without proper registration. The system doesn't know that there's any data there, but obviously the bad actor does. Some attacks can obviously be based on design and coding flaws, obviously rootkits, and then incremental attacks. So data diddling is doing very small changes to data over time. Instead of changing everything all at once, we're going to change little pieces of information very slowly. The version of incremental attack that we also talk about is called the salami attack, which I refer to as the office space attack. Um, or the Superman 3 attack, depending on how many times you've seen Office Space. But the idea that you have a block of salami, and I'm just going to slice off a little bit, and no one's even going to notice because it's just a little tiny slice. The Office Space one is we're going to, you know, for each transaction, when you round up the pennies, instead of doing the, the rounding down or the rounding up, we're going to take that little fraction of a penny and store it to the side. It's so small, no one's really going to notice it. But over time, people do. One of the sites that's always a good one to keep an eye on is the OWASP Top 10. This is going to give you the top 10 attacks that are going on right now. These are going to change over time. I think it was a year or two ago, the most common attack was a SQL injection attack. It's not anymore. Um, and it might be again tomorrow. I have no idea. So these change all the time. You always want to keep an eye on the OWASP Top 10 to find out what attacks are most common right now to make sure your company is prepared for them. So a summary of vulnerabilities. Remember, organizations never work in isolation. It is everybody's responsibility in a company to share the security relationship and responsibility in that company. If you can design your computer systems to be secure, design them early. This goes back to our software development lifecycle conversation of make sure that your computing systems are designed securely from the beginning. Make sure you understand the operating modes and the storage types and the common protection mechanisms that work in your hardware and in your software. Make sure that your system function and purpose and your design work towards establishing and supporting security rather than against it. You don't want to do security last like, oh gosh, I guess we should go put security in now. Should always, everything from the functionality and the design work should always be working towards security. Understanding how virtualization technology works and making sure you understand how the risks are involved along with the rewards. Sometimes you have to do company work in embedded systems or HPCs using that edge computing or fog computing or mobile. Understand each of these little industries. You may never need to know it and you might need to know it for your next job interview. So make sure that that's at least something that you have a basic understanding of. And no matter how sophisticated your system is, the flaws always can exist that attackers can, can exploit. Some are introduced by the prog programmers and some are introduced by the architectural design issues. Always have a defense in depth and a layered environment so that no matter how sophisticated, it's hard to get into that system. If they can break through one, there's still another layer there that they can get through or that they, that they get blocked by. Thank you for watching this on the CISSP Chapter 9 on Vulnerabilities. Please come back next time when we talk about our business continuity plans and our disaster recovery. Have a great day.